I uh, hope everybody did the pre-class reading because we're going to cover the exact same material anyways here. Figure before we sh begin, uh, you should all get to know me a little bit, so I'll spare you the class icebreakers and just you myself. Uh, I'm Commander Tuna, Professor of Minology here at the Pixis Blackwood Center with a doctorate in Mine Wizardry. I do hold office hours on Friday from 4.30 to 6.30 in Team Morebred, uh, but that's only by request, so send me an email or rather a Discord message if you want to sign up. Uh, some of you may be familiar uh, with some of the accomplishments, so to say, or as I like to call them, my horrors, uh, especially if there's any testers currently in the auditorium. Uh, in particular, my mine lighting liner, Matroshka, whose crest you can see is somewhat infamous for its actions, specifically the Nyx slowdown incident. And even today, the volume of mines I like to throw around is somewhat notable. Uh, now, given the effort some have put into making this lecture happen, thank you to Not So Lone Wolf, who is here for setting this up. I do want all of you to take some knowledge away from this class, and while I will be providing a lecture as before mentioned, uh, I do actually recommend taking notes to facilitate memory and processing uh, of the information. Uh, handwritten is typically best for this, but whatever way works for you. Uh, you may also find quizzing yourself or your fellow classmates to be helpful, and um, nothing really teaches the material, or nothing helps you learn it than uh, teaching somebody else. And uh, despite my earlier comment about us covering several, similar ground, I will um, not be retreading everything I said on the guide, uh, but I will be covering some of it uh, here. So the most foundational knowledge for mines is how does the mine operate? Uh, as illustrated in these fantastic images from our very own uh, Screamer, uh, mines search for a magnetic signature within a two kilometer radius. Uh, only hulls will emit these. That means things like active decoys will not trigger your mines. The mine then cross-checks using an IFF via comms. Should that check fail, be it because it is an enemy vessel or because the vessel has no comms for whatever reason, the mine will activate a radar seeker and begin flying in the direction of the detected anomaly. All mines, regardless of their type, behave in this manner. However, that doesn't mean all of the mines are the same. The most foundational of all the mines is the M30 Matic mine. Now the M30 has a magnetic activation of two kilometers, as mentioned before. This will check for things such as obstructions, which can be rocks or whatnot, but it isn't perfect. It does have an active radar seeker. Notably, the active radar seeker only has a range of 1.75 kilometers. Now what that means is that a, there is a very short window where an opponent could do something like chaff or fire an active decoy to pull your mine away from the ship. It also means that if you are between an opponent who activates a mine and the activated mine, the Maddox can and will go for you. This is something opponents can use against you, and so it's something to be mindful of, especially when operating within or around your own fields. Now on kind of a more general note, the mine has a 3.75 kilometer fuel range, meaning it can chase people out of the field, and it moves at a base movement speed of 250 meters a second, costing six points per Maddox. Now we'll get into this more later, but the M30 is really your foundational mine. It's not the best mine, it's very much the generalist mine, but just because it's basic doesn't mean you should disregard it outright in favor of the fancier siblings, which we're about to get into. So just keep this in mind as you, as we proceed through the lecture here. Now the M30N, which is our second mine, is very much, I think, the popular sibling between the M30 uh, and the M30N. It's easy to see why looking at the name. Now. Cooperative mines are identical to the M30. They have the same activation range, same um, obstruction checks, same seeker, same fuel, same speed, same cost. And the reason is that's actually more because it's a side raid than a direct upgrade. The main feature of cooperative mines is that they are network capable. What network capability means in this instance is that when one mine activates, it will activate other mines around it to engage the same target, even if that target has not entered their individual activation range. This activation style makes the cooperative mines really effective against larger ships with more comprehensive point defense networks or larger ships or larger groups of ships um, as you're going to get a much larger volume of mines moving towards the same target which can overwhelm point defense. However, with cooperative mines there is a caveat because of course there's a caveat. Why not always use the M30N if it's the same cost and it's better at beating point defense networks? Well, it has downsides that don't really show up in the stat table, particularly in regards to how it operates. Now, first of all, one thing I think people don't notice a lot is the cooperative mines have a much higher incidence of rock point defense or hitting a rock, uh, to put it simply. 
Um, the reason this happens, I think, is that when one mine activates, it starts moving towards the ship, uh, and while that mine has a direct line of sight, it passes its obstruction check, other mines it might activate may not have passed their obstruction checks ordinarily, but activate regardless to move with the cooperative. Now, I don't know if that is intended behavior, but I have noticed that this does happen a lot more with co-ops, and so if you're having problems with your mines all slamming into a rock, you may wish to try using less co-ops in your fields. Now, another reason that co-ops aren't really the optimal mine is you have suicide clearing. Now, let's say you put down this big, nice field on a point or some location, and you're thinking, okay, ANS is never gonna get through this, and then ANS runs a single, 250 point Corvette straight into your minefield, clears 600 points of mines, and now they're moving right through that area. You you will see this happen. It's very common, especially with larger fields. I've had examples where ANS throw multiple ships into one of my minefields because when it comes to the cooperatives, if there's enough co-ops in place, um, the fastest option is to suicide clear. Um, you can sit away and chip away at the field, but the fastest thing to do if they think that they're pressed for time is just run one ship in and the minefield will clear itself for the most part. Now, another thing which is very similar and relates to the co-op aspect is there's a very real aspect of overkill with cooperative mines. Uh, for instance, with the same example, you have 600 points of mines activating on a 250 point Corvette. Now, these may not be realistic point amounts, it's just for demonstration's sake, but when you have all these mines hitting the ship, it's complete overkill, and it's increasing the amount of points you're spending for that kill. And one of the main reasons that's happening is the magnetic activation of mines doesn't trigger on a dead ship. But with the co-ops, when one mine activates, it's activating all these other mines, and it's pulling them towards the target. So normally what happens is when the ship dies, it'll stop triggering new mines. And then because this co-op activation, it's pulling them in, um, and so then you're having these mines that normally wouldn't have activated are now being expended on a ship that's already dead. It's total overkill, it's, a, it's, it's degrading your field, and it's not doing anything for the point cost. Now, I'm going to cover uses for the M30N. It's a very useful tool. It's not something I'm saying you should totally disregard, but it's not the direct upgrade it appears on paper. Now, last but certainly not least in terms of the mines, you do have the M50 Augur Sprint Mine. Now, these have the same activation, the same seeker. What they have, interestingly, is an extra 100 meters of fuel, uh, bringing them up to 3,850 meters. And most importantly, they have a 700 meter second movement speed. They also cost 10 points, so a four point increase over the six cost of the other two mines. Now what augers are really good at here is being anti-point defense and notably anti-capital. When supported properly, augers can get through really strong point defense and they open the gate for other mines to come and hit. And when they hit, they're destroying things like point defense, like radar panels, etc. And it really opens up the ability for more mines to hit when they normally would get shot down. Now, you can use pure auger mines. There's disadvantages to that, but in terms of pure point defense penetration, the auger is really the end-all be-all. Um, sorry. Uh, and when combined with other mines, there's also some additional uh, interactions between the auger and other mines that can really increase your field's effectiveness, which we'll get into uh, a bit later here. So now that we understand tools of our trade, we have to understand what the goal of our trade is. Why are we using these mines? And the main reason, or the main one rather, is that you're going to be producing vulnerable um, maneuver that can be exploited. Now, in less fancy terms, what that means is your mines are going to be restricting where the enemy team can move. You're going to be slowing them down. You're going to be making areas that are dangerous to maneuver into. And these delays, these, these changes of route can be exploited by your team to get an edge. Another reason we're using these mines is we're looking to split the enemy team up. Now, this may seem a little counterproductive. After all, the smart thing to do in the face of a large point defense threat is to actually group together to, to form a blob. But people don't really think of mines in the same way that they think of missiles, because the mines don't move until you activate them. So what's going to happen is unless you have a very good coordinated team, is people are going to split up 
um, in the face of these minefields. And, and even good coordinated teams can do this. Uh, because you're now faced with a choice. You're faced with a, a split in the road effectively. You can go around the mines and try to circumnavigate it and go around. Or you can clear the mines. Now, what might happen is they disagree or they just don't really coordinate their action and one part of the group starts clearing and another group starts moving to go around the minefield or go elsewhere on the map. And in this situation, you've just taken a, a death ball and you've split it up without sacrificing a ship um, because an element of that blob is now stuck clearing your mines while the rest of the group moves on. Um, and either way, of like what happens here, it's an advantage to your team because it piecemeals the enemy force. And it can give you an in to start defeating in detail what was otherwise a cohesive enemy force. Now, another reason you use mines, it, obviously, is you want to see a ship get ripped in half by a mine. Um, obviously, fate, killing an enemy with the mine is something you want to see with your field. It's obviously something that... Um, is a win in most situations as long as you're not overkilling a ship. Now mines are notable because they have 100 damage rays over the normal high explosive of 50. This means they can break a lot more damage thresholds and you can very easily be killing ships of the enemy team or just inflicting damage onto them. Another thing you can be doing with mines is you can exploit the capabilities of other weapon systems. And now what do I mean by that? Because it seems a lot like the first point doesn't it? Now, in particular, there's a few weapon systems that really benefit on OSP from holding somebody in a position. And if you're thinking Master Driver, you get yourself a digital point because Master Drivers really pair well with mines. If an enemy has to sit in place to clear mines before advancing onto a point or wherever you dropped your mines, which are almost always near rocks, so they're going to be uh, having to stay away from these mines, which are near the rocks. And what that means is they're going to be out in the void. They're going to be away from cover. Um, so they're going to be exposed for mass Drivers to hit them. Now there's other tools that really benefit from this. For instance, you can use it to provide cover for um, 450 line ships or 250 line ships, which are gonna be able to pop out and engage the enemy in the open. And generally what you're gonna be doing is you're, you're holding people back and you're holding them away from the rocks. And these things really benefit OSP's longer range options, such as the mass drivers, the 450s, and even missiles, though to a much lesser degree, um, which we'll get into uh, the synergy between mines and missiles at a later point. but keep in mind that that's another way you can combine them. And finally, the really obvious one is you're going to be protecting friendly forces from enemy maneuver and infiltration. Now, when you're using these mines, something someone's going to clear the mines by shooting it, someone's going to activate the mines by entering its radius, or someone's going to get pushed away by those mines. And if any of those things happen, the mine wins. Because what this has done is this has protected your team by giving you information that you either destroyed hurt and hurt an enemy ship, or you now know where an enemy ship is because you see them shooting your mines, or you prevented the enemy from going there entirely. Uh, furthermore, with the enemies clearing mines, sometimes you'll have enemies who could be shooting at teammates and are instead shooting at the mines, and that gives your team time to maneuver themselves to react to this uh, enemy force who would otherwise have snuck up on you or gotten into your back line. Now, to accomplish these goals, um, we have three different types of minefields. Your first category is protective minefields, which I think is a very self-explanatory category. Uh, these are mines that are defending objectives, defending flanks, anything you do with the goal of, I want to protect this blank. The second goal is, uh, pardon me, the second type is tactical minefields, which includes zoning minefields. So these are less about, I want to defend the spot, and more, I want to manipulate the enemy team in this manner. It's not, I don't want to protect this asteroid, it's I want to keep the enemy away from this asteroid, so they instead go to a more predictable location, or a more favorable location for your team. Uh, you could argue that some of that is protective, but in my mind, because the end goal uh, is different, it's a different type of minefield. Uh, the final category of minefields is nuisance minefields. Now, this is a much more broad category because it's inherently asymmetrical. So nuisance mines are things like uh, what I call gotcha mines, which are small batches of mines hidden in weird spots for the whole goal of catching somebody completely off guard. You have container mines, which I'll get into um, in its own section later. 
And you also have what I call limited capacity mine layer attacks, which is basically mine laying vessels that are not using mines as their primary and are rather using mines as a um, tool primarily for lethality. So now looking specifically at what you need to do for each category, protected mines as before are rather self-explanatory. Um, so mines placed as tripwires, which is what I refer to when you place a mine with the goal of using it as an alert system. So when you see this mine get activated or shot, you know somebody is in this section of the map. Uh, they can fall under the protective category. Um, those are generally placed on kind of these, these weird flank routes where you don't really expect the mines to get seen or activated. Um, protective fields generally trigger the block and turn effects. Now this is part of a group of five effects that I have of minefields, which we'll get into in a minute, but just keep in mind that protective fields block and turn. And generally your protective fields, as a rule of thumb, are going to be comprised of M30s and M50s. Um, you're not really going to be using cooperative fields in a protective, um, the cooperative mines in a protective field, uh, mainly because the main category that makes it a protective field is they take a while to clear and a while to push through. And so your main enforcer, your main killing element is the M50s and the M30s are there for the volume. That's a rule of thumb. You can break that rule. Uh, it's up to you, but that's how I consider it. Um, somebody is uh, hot miking. Uh, if you could just check and make sure to mute yourself. Yeah. Now, tactical fields. As... I will hold on. You, you got that, Wolf? Yeah, I'll serve mute. Thank you. Now, tactical fields, as um, mentioned before, focus on keeping enemies away. Um, a good tactical minefield tries to not get triggered. Now, I don't mean that as in the enemy team doesn't know this field existed, never triggered. I mean that the enemy team clearly reacts to the minefield, um, and yet that minefield goes without being triggered, and that's when you know you have a good tactical minefield. Now, minefields trigger disrupt and turn effects, turn being shared with block, but now there's disrupt here. Uh, once again, we'll get into this. Uh, and there's also an emphasis on kind of the psychological aspect with tactical fields. Um, because if the enemy thinks they can get through it, they most often will get through it. So you have to play to the psychology and a, and a bit to the situation uh, to convince the enemy that it's worth going around over trying to break through or destroy the field. Now, um, generally you're going to want M30s and M50s, uh, similar to a protective field. But you may also wish to add M30Ns for additional enforcement if you think your field doesn't have enough uh, bite for its bark to get hit that psychological threshold. Nuisance mines um, are very asymmetrical, as mentioned before. They're best when they're completely unpredictable. So there's a very heavy as uh, psychological aspect to the nuisance mines. Now, they very rarely involve M30s, unless it's container mines. Uh, but once again, we'll get into that. And they're best with M30Ns or M50s. Because unlike with the other fields, where you want your fields to have uh, a pressure on the map, nuisance fields are, are kind of the opposite. You don't want pressure with them, uh, because what you want is more the psychological aspect of there could be a mine under every rock. Now, you want these fields to deal damage. Um, the primary goal with these fields is to deal that damage because that's how you're going to get the psychological aspect. So, sprint mines under five sprint mines underneath a random rock is a great way to knock out some completely random capper corb or some scout reins. And then, uh, same with M30Ns. And when you assassinate these random ships in these low volumes, um, and you're using these the M30N and the M50s because they'll have point defense penetration, um, this will really make people feel cautious on the map. They won't feel safe moving around the map. Uh, and in doing that, you're going to restrict enemy movement because they won't feel as free to move around. They'll be taking corners wide, um, so on and so forth. They'll be staying away from cover. And as mentioned before, that really synergizes well with a lot of OSP's weapons. Um, unlike a, a um, protective or a tactical minefield, nuisance mines don't need support to do their job. They're honestly best when they're completely out of left field and away from your team, because if the enemy sees all of your ships are on one side of the map and then someone dies on the other, they're going to be really confused on what happened, and if they know it's a mine, 
they're now going to worry where else are their mines. So here's a small list, non-exhaustive list, of general mine combinations and what their role can be. This isn't a hard rule. I'm not going to come track you down if uh, you dare use M50s and M30Ns together in a protective field. But in my opinion, this is a good list to reference um, if you don't have your own experience yet to determine your own combinations for your preferences and whatnot. This is kind of what I would call a textbook standard um, of what you should be looking to do. And then from there, you can experiment, find your niche within mining, find what you prefer within mining. So here's those effects I mentioned earlier and, here, and where we get into a bit more of the kind of theoretical or, or perhaps um, cerebral, I guess, element of minefields. Now we can talk statistics all day, but in the end, minefields don't really show damage numbers. Um, they, you can't show damage numbers when you change a player's decision making. And so instead of tracking those easily trackable statistics, because those statistics aren't really relevant to the main aspect, of, I think, of minefields, you instead have to qualify what a minefield is doing on more of a strategic and game sense. And so that's where we get into these different effects. Um, now, what some people may have noticed in the bottom left corner, that there is a citation for a real world manual from the Department of the Army. Um, and the reason I've been citing this is it's been giving me kind of terms to discuss these effects and reading this document, the ideas are, are actually very applicable to Nebulous, which I think is rather interesting. And another interesting thing is that the real world army isn't tracking mine effects and how many people is this going to kill? How much equipment is this going to destroy? And I think that's something you should really consider as well with Nebulous, because in Nebulous, you have the same deal with the mines. Um, their main goal isn't to kill. But it's rather the killing is the enforcement of the effect, and the effect is actually what you want to do. So when you're looking at a minefield, unless it's a nuisance minefield, which is psychological and focused on killing, um, you're really looking instead at the purpose you want rather than the lethality. Um, so for instance, you could say, okay, I want to disrupt the enemy, what do I need to do for that? And then you build your field from there. Um, another thing you might have noticed is I put a big line through the center of the slide, and that's because disrupt and fix are linked, turn and slash pivot and block are linked, and psychological is kind of its own thing that can float between them, because a disrupt field can be psychological, a block field can be psychological, or a field can be purely psychological alone. So the first effect we're going to look into here is the disrupt fields. One of the key elements of a disrupt field is its ability to, not that it needs to fully stop an enemy, but what it needs to do is halt momentum. Now what that could mean is say you got enemies chasing a teammate or they just push through one of the caps and now they're moving towards the next one. When you have a minefield in the way, what it can do is it makes them hold or think about what they need to do. This can either take the form of they come to a stop or slow down, which is vital for giving your team time to respond. It could also make enemies completely reassess an attack. Um, for instance, if they round a corner, see a big old minefield, they may decide to not attack at that time or wait for a field to get cleared before they push an attack. Shrub fields are also one of the main fields that tend to split death blobs up. Um, when you're building a disrupt field, you primarily want M30 uh, ends because your goal is not to be uh, hard to, to kill or uh, hard to clear or even particularly get kills. But rather, the reason you're using these network mines is they have um, probably one of the stronger enforcements for the point cost. And so with this field, you know you're not about, you're not going, a, sorry, you you're not going to be focused on kills. You're not focusing on being taking this long time to clear, but what you're really doing is you're forcing a choice. And you want the enemy to say, okay, there's a minefield, what am I doing? And then when they have to take that assessment and not just pursue your teammate or push right through that cap, um, that means your disrupt field is doing its job. Similarly to disruption minefields, um, fixing minefields also want to slow an offensive, but for a bit of a different reason. So while a disrupt field is looking to merely break up momentum, merely looking to throw a wrench in the gear, so to say, a fixed field is doing more or less the same thing. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to um, tie, tie the enemy up while they're clearing a fixed field. If they're holding point defense assets 
if there's a Sarissa frigate, uh, it doesn't matter as much, but if it's something like a 250 Vauxhall group spending time putting 250 RPF in your field, um, or even if it ships with point defense just slowly approaching uh, a field here, um, what you're doing is you're buying time and you're holding those assets in place. Um, they're not going around the map. And what this is doing is this buying time for maneuver and isolation. Uh, where now you know this Vauxhall group is clearing these mines, you're able to move freely around the map knowing where that Vauxhall group is, knowing that they're distracted, and you can move into position to engage this theoretical Vauxhall group when maybe their team has left them or their team is not in a good position to respond to an attack on that Vauxhall group. When you're making these kind of fixed fields, one of the things you're going to be looking for is you don't necessarily want one big field like you would with the disruption field. What you primarily want is multiple fields that are close enough together that they'll hit the same thing, but that you can't clear from the same vantage point. Now let's say on pillars over the B point, there's some areas you can place mines that will still enforce, uh, for instance, anyone approaching the B point, but they won't be able to be cleared from the same spot if you place kind of above the rock and also below the rock. Both of those fields can interact with the point if they're gonna fix, they're going to fix anyone approaching the point, but you can't clear them just by parking above or below the field. And that's the kind of thing you want to be doing primarily with these fixing fields. Now with the fixed field, you're primarily going to be using M30 mines because one of the main things you're doing is you're, de you're a delaying asset. You want to have as many mines as possible. You don't want a suicide sprinter clearing your minefields. And so you want these basic mines because they're going to be the slowest and most painful thing to clear. And your goal is to entice the enemy to expend that time clearing your field. If they're spending the time and the effort to clear an entire fixed field, then that fixed field has won. Now, turn and pivot is the next kind of uh, level, so to say, above a disrupted or a fixed field. And this is where you're going to start needing a lot of mines or a lot of threat from your minefields to reach this point. Um, we'll get into those kind of thresholds here in a moment. But with a turn and pivot field, you're going to be this is gonna be kind of your primary zoning element for say a tactical field. Uh, you're gonna build these around an anchor point, which is an area that you put extra mines in to make uh, going around the field seem easier. So let's say you place 20 mines in one area and 10 mines to one of its sides. Now what that's gonna do is they're gonna see the giant bundle of mines by the 20 and the lighter area on the 10, and they're more likely to push towards from the right side by that 10. And in doing so, you're changing their direction. Um, now, why don't they just go around the field? Now, the reason they're not going to just go around the field is with these turn and pivot fields, you're always going to build these around terrain features and major avenues. So when you do that, you're making it so they either take a really long and roundabout route to get away, or they have to go either through the field, or they have to do what the turn and pivot field wants and turn to go through the easier side. The minefield in this case is trying to persuade someone to go a specific direction and control where they are. And in doing that, they need to be hard to clear so they can't just bulldoze right through it. This means, once again, you're going to be using a lot of M30 mines for volume and sprint mines for enforcement uh, as you're really trying to prevent things like suicide clears in, say, that, group, that anchor point of 20. If they run a sprinter in there, clear out all those mines and your anchor point dissolves, your turn field is not going to work as a turn field anymore. Now our last effect here, or not last effect, but our last primary effect here is the one people are probably most familiar with already. Um, blocking effects are very common in games. It's probably the most well used OSP strategy so far. And these are generally the minefields that are placed on caps. But the point is that a enemy does not go to whatever is being defended. Their, total, their goal is the total prevention of movement into that area. They're designed to restrict movement in that very specific place. They're not trying to zone enemies. They're not meant to interrupt enemies. They are meant to be a kind of end all be all. You are not taking this zone. So to accomplish that, you need a lot of mines and you need a very high amount of lethalities with these block um, fields. Uh, you're kind of trying to say anywhere but here is worth it with these fields. That is that is what you want your fields to say when people see it. Um, I've had times with these fields where three battleships are sitting over one of my minefields and not a single one of them wants to try it because they've already lost ships to the mines and there's too many mines for them to clear easily. And so th those three battleships 
despite being directly over one of the caps, decided to go push E instead of capping the point because it just wasn't worth it. Now, because you're gonna be dealing with all sorts of ships, primarily capitals and their point defense networks, you're gonna want a lot of sprint mines for um, these defensive blocking minefields. They're just the best penetration you can get against the targets. But you're also gonna wanna implement M30N and M30 mines for the volume as said earlier. Um, the, the M30 mines are really for the clear um, delay and the volume of the mine, and the N30Ns are gonna make it so that the sprint mines uh, have a better chance of penetration by creating a lot of very active point defense targets when a ship tries to walk in. Um, if you have five M30Ns activate and two sprint mines, suddenly there's a lot flying at that ship and it's gonna overwhelm the point defense a lot easier than if it's just M30s and sprint mines or if it's just co-op mines. Uh, and the reason that is, is um, due to bouncing, which I'll go into the details of in a few slides here. So, as I said before, psychological is kind of this overarching effect that can fit into all four of these different effect types and is also an effect of its own. Ships that could clear mines are sometimes delayed or even entirely prevented from approaching heavily mined areas by their player. This is because the wall of tracks that can appear from a mine field, especially under burn through sweeps, can be rather intimidating um, or just straight up overwhelming to people to look at. Now, this can be contributed further to having prior mine fatalities. Um, prior mine fatalities really increase player wariness about mines. It reinforces the idea that these are a threat. Um, generally, people will see a mine, they'll say, oh, it's a mine, but after they've lost ships to mines, suddenly that mine is a lot scarier than it was before. Um, you know, it kind of, it ticks a box that these mines are a threat to me, and they'll, you'll, you'll see in your games when you're playing with minefields, the second you've killed a ship with them, they'll act very differently, and it increases their caution quite a bit. Um, now, another thing that people don't really think about that is a psychological aspect of these minefields is that when you're clearing minefields, you're not doing other things. And now I know that seems obvious as hell, um, but people don't really consider that as much as you might think um, on the surface. You may recall some examples yourself that you've either seen using mines or having cleared mines where you get kind of caught up clearing the minefield and you stop really watching the point counter or you stop really watching your environment. Um, and you're also, most importantly, you're not maneuvering on the map. Uh, and when you're not maneuvering on that map, you're not capping points, and it, it can really catch up on you where your team is completely dominating in the fight. OSP is hiding under rocks. They're not taking you in that fight because they keep losing it. And yet you're losing on points, or you've nearly lost the game because the other team has had a point advantage for the majority of the game because you've spent so much time clearing the minefields that you haven't been capping. And people don't really think about this in the same way they would think a blocking ship would. Um, you know, a battleship or a voxel group could probably kick a feeder off a point in about two to three minutes or disable it, make it un not offensive capable, uh, and, and start capping that point. Meanwhile, the binds can hold them in place for that amount of time or, or even longer, and they don't really consider it a pressure or a delay in the same way that they would from the ship. It's the mines are kind of almost this third passive element that they don't really associate as an action, an active action from the enemy team, from OSP. And so, with that kind of failing to associate it as this is something an OSP player is actively doing to hinder me, you can take advantage of it to put pressure on the map without having to be there um, with the ability to still maneuver all of your ships freely on the map um, without even needing direct line of sight or radar on the area. And you can also extend how much time people have to spend for these caps, which give you time to react and gives you an advantage in the point game. Now, I know this slide is gonna make some people happy and some people very concerned because we have some graphics here. Now, you may be thinking with these last four categories, five on the account of psychological, how do I accomplish these goals and what differentiates a field uh, between the two? Is it just a personal? Uh, now, this is more or less a personal definition and this is my attempt at demonstrating a criteria. Now, none of these values are hard rules, uh, despite what the lines of the graph may be portraying. It's really more of a soft rule. 
And it's kind of a tool to look at if I want a disrupt field, how many mines do I need of what types? Now this graph has some serious limitations, which I'm gonna quickly mention. First of all, this is assuming you're facing one ship at a time. It's also assuming that you're using only one type of mine for the field, which I've already discussed is not optimal. And also this graph is not necessarily based off of some hard uh, gathered data because it is hard to quantify a reaction within a category within a game. Now I can ballpark it. I can say, okay, I think this minefield's disrupted him, but it's not hard data associated with the number of mines. Uh, instead, this is my best attempt at kind of a guideline uh, for the mines and the type for the effect. Um, so don't really consider these fully accurate, but let's get into the what the graph is showing. Now the probability effects on the graph is how many mines you need to achieve an effect or on the enemy or a pressure on the enemy as approximated as a percent, with 100% being no way they're going to ignore this minefield, and 0% being there is no minefield. Now obviously the, the more you're affecting the enemy, the stronger the effect is. Now if you're at 80% of an effect, you're going to be turning and blocking people because the minefield is a significant consideration for their options. If you're somewhere in the 40 range, you're more likely to disrupt or fix somebody than fully block or fully turn them, uh, especially if they have more than one ship. And once you've hit in, you know, 25 mines, you, you've hit 25 mines rather, you start hitting psychological side of things because of the amount of tracks there is, the obvious exception being nuisance mines. Now something I'm going to quickly bring up, because it's obvious when you're looking at the two graphs, is what the hell is going on with the graph on the right? Uh, because it's a little twisty, isn't it? Um, now that's the Axford versus the Solomon graph, and unlike the other graph, which keeps pretty consistently Sprinter on the left, Vauxhall on the right, and the other ships are assumed to be in the middle, um, the twisting here is because, in my opinion, the Solomon defense network is actually really bad against mines, uh, particularly in certain situations. Uh, this is because the Solomon's point defense mounts are primarily located on the sides, and when people approach minefields, they usually do so nose on. Now, a good player will go in broadside with the Solomon, but it doesn't always happen. And so, in my opinion, especially at some values and with specific types of mines, the Solomon tends to perform worse or roughly equivalent to the Axford in these situations here. Now, one of the main differences is that the Solomon player tends to think of themselves as having better point defense than the Axford player, even if it is really roughly the same. And so it's much harder to trigger a psychological effect against a battleship player than it is an Axford player. Uh, so that is just something to consider. Now, as much as I love the graphical style of these graphs, I stole this uh, style from that uh, US Department uh, of the Army uh, manual. We're gonna go to a bit more of an easily readable graph set. Now, this one is a bit more uh, easy to read in terms of the data, although keep in mind that the axis has changed to percents on the bottom, mines on the top. And it also illustrates one of the effects that may have been a little harder to see, which is unlike M30 mines and M50 mines, which are rather linear, M30Ns tend to be a little less predictable. Uh, this is because M30Ns tend to have this maximal effic efficiency, where past a certain point, it doesn't matter how many more mines you have, you're going to have the same effect on the target. Uh, and past that point, it's not really getting more effective per mine, you're just maintaining the same effect per mine. Um, and this is also because considering the types of point defense networks, at a certain point, um, you really need to start hitting things like sprint mines for an increase of effect, especially at lower mine volumes. Um, so you'll see something like uh, the sprinter, it, it really caps out around 15 mines uh, because past 15 mines, you're you're killing the sprinter no matter what, unless it's seriously lucky or a group of sprinters. And remember, this is only versus one ship at a time. And so if you want to get a higher effectiveness, you're gonna need to start using something like M50s. Now, I said those last ones were pure fields, uh, and you do not want to be doing that, as I've stressed a few times throughout this lecture. So what mines do you bring? Well, I've got a quote here from that very same handbook, which is 
Neither anti-personnel nor anti-tank mines are used in isolation. The preponderance of mine composition is designed against the most severe close combat threat and the likelihood of that threat. And you want to be considering something very similar when it comes to your fields. When you're placing these fields down, think about what is your goal and what is your likely target. For instance, if you're thinking, I just want to place an anti-cat block field and you want to accomplish that block effect primarily against the sprinter. To do that, you only are going to need about 15 co-op mines or so. So you can use those 15 co-op mines to get that block effect. But what happens if a non-sprinter shows up? Suddenly, those 15 co-op mines might not do anything. So you want to consider that other ships other than your main target can and likely will show up and you're going to want to feel um, you're going to want to feel that can defeat these other kinds of threats, even if it's not your intended target. So what to bring in reality is, uh, as, as much as this isn't helpful, experience really is your friend. You're going to learn very quickly from doing mine laying where people tend to go, what ships they bring, how different ships react to minefields. It, it's, it's all very different. It's very hard for me to express. So that's something you're going to have to experiment with. But just remember that mixed fields are always better than pure fields. And this is where we're going to get to bouncing and is one of the main reasons why a mixed field is so much better. Now, something like the sprint mines, when combined with normal mines, can cause a very specific behavior in point defense, which I call bouncing, which is when a new mine activates and it has a, a sooner or a quicker time on target and thus becomes the point defense priority but from the director. What then happens is that the Defenders, which is one of the most likely threats against your minefields, are not going to be able to stick on one mine for a particularly long amount of time, or long enough to kill it, as they're going to have to swap to these new sprint mine threats um, as they come in. Uh, and also it prevents this kind of optimal pattern where the defender goes from closest target, closest target, closest target. Instead, it's going to be bouncing from mine you know, 600 meters away, sprint mine 800 meters away, mine 500 meters away, and it's going to be targeting mines that could be in very different quadrants, and it's wasting time doing the slewing, it's wasting time getting the tracers or the, the slugs on target. And so you can get an increase of point defense penetration from the same amount of mines um, than if you were using pure augers even, or pure maddox, because this behavior really does decrease the point effectiveness against both types. So now that we've figured out what kind of mines we're using and what the mines are doing and what the fields are going to look like, we have to figure out how we're going to get those fields in place. And there's really three main categories um, for your mines. The first category is what I call HVMLs or high volume mine layers. Uh, this comprises your cargo feeder or monitors and your bulk freighters or line ships. Your second category is nuisance layers, which primarily consists of the container hauler. And your final category uh, is low capacity mine layers, which are going to be things like the tug, which is a clipper, shuttle, which is a clipper. Um, although it is worth noting that the shuttle can operate within a nuisance role. Getting into these categories, we're going to start first with the HVMLs. HVMLs are categorized by their two main attributes, which is that they carry a large amount of mines generally in multiple magazines, and they have a lot of ML9s, which allow them to quickly deploy a field of sufficient quantity um, when you need them to. In particular, your HVMLs are somewhat, somewhat to say your combat engineers, which is that they're your dedicated team that's going to be focused primarily on laying mines over anything else you have. But an HVML can use secondary weapons despite this. Your focus, however, does have to be on the mines uh, as it's going to take a lot of internal mag space, it's going to take a lot of hard mount space um, for the ML9s and such. Uh, a rather noticeable example of an HVML um, is something like a mine line ship, which um, while n considerably nerfed is still possible and it's notable because of how extreme of an example of an HVML it is. Um, it can carry hundreds of mines, place nearly 50 of them simultaneously and it allows some for some very fast and rapid minefield deployment. Next in very much a category of its own is the container liner um, and I wanted to dedicate a whole slide to the container liner because the container liner is just really very different from other types of mine layers. It has some unique advantages and unique disadvantages to the platform. 
Their primary advantage is they have the ability to place mines remotely with minimal risk to the hull. Now, this is a downside that the other mine layers share, share in that you can get shot on the way. You can get caught out of position and stuck somewhere. There's a lot of ways you can misplay uh, your positioning. And the container liner kind of sidesteps this by being able to place mines at such an extreme distance. The trade-off being you're only able to place M30s. Now, this isn't a terrible downside, but when you're looking at your two best point defense penetrating options, losing rather, it really drops the lethality of your field and makes you feel it's kind of not really having enough enforcement. So instead, I tend to position the container liner into a nuisance layer role because you can send these container outs to every random corner of the map, even when enemies are watching these spots, and as long as they don't have direct line of sight on the eventual end position of the mines, they can get placed no problem. So you can place a bunch of these mines in, you know, little groups of four to six um, containers or six or, uh, you know, 10, 15 mines under these rock, random rocks. Uh, you can do more, you can do less. There's a lot of flexibility inherent in the platform. And by doing this, you make the entire map a possible threat. Instead of it being these are the common areas that, you know, people place their minefields. Um, instead, every single piece of terrain could have a mine under it. And there's pretty big value in that. The other two areas where the container liner really excels is in mine bombing. Now, you can do this with any mine layer, but the container liner is better at it. And what mine bombing is, is because the Maddox can do 100 damage, uh, do 100 damage raise, you can use them as finishing tools for crippled or disabled ships. The way you do this is with either a mining vessel or a container liner. Uh, you deploy mines within two kilometers of your crippled ship of choice, and then you make sure all of the friendly ships have left the area. Once the activation timer goes down, the ship is going to get hit by those mines and more than likely not die to them. Because the container liner can do this remotely, it's able to say, look at a Axford that just got disabled by a missile strike, throw container mines onto it, and if that Axford doesn't get up in time, those mines will finish it off. Another area that the container liner particularly excels at is reactionary mine laying. Now, the other types of mine layings that the other vessels are capable of is very much a preventative measure. You want to think, okay, what am I going to do to make the enemy react to me? With reactionary mining, you're flipping the script and you're saying, okay, what is the enemy doing and what can I do to throw a wrench into that? So reactionary mines, um, you know, can be something like you see enemies approaching on the side of the map, you throw a wall of mines down their way or around a corner, and you're very much reacting to their presence on the field. And you can do this with the other mine layers, but um, they have a bit of an issue with that in that they have to endanger themselves to act in this reactionary manner. Whereas the container liner can do it completely out of harm's way, completely safe and without risk to the other mines that you're carrying. Finally, but not least, you do have the low capacity mine layers. Now, these are one of the weakest classes of mine layers, and I would hesitate to say that they're proper mine layers, but one of their defining features is that they are nearly completely unable to meet the turn or block thresholds with their fields, but they can still meet, disrupt, and fix using particular types of mines. Notably, things such as the M30Ns or the M50s. They're very, very rarely pure mine layer. Generally, you're gonna have one, maybe two ML9s and something else that is the uh, primary tool of that vessel. Um, the mines in this case are just there to serve as an auxiliary, another tool in the box. As, as you see, I've got an image of a theoretical shuttle that I built, which has a rocket for various attacks and also mine laying ML9 to be able to throw some mines down on a point before it goes hiding in a rock. Now, just because these are not pure mine layers and they're using, um, uh, sorry, and they're using mines as a secondary, doesn't mean they can't be useful within a mining role. These vehicles are very often high speed, very often low cost, and unlike the container liner, they can place any type of mine. And what that's really useful for is placing M30Ns or M50 mines around the map. You're very rarely going to be placing M30s because with the low capacity, you just really can't make M30s work against anything but the smallest of ships or the most, uh, or ships without point defense. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier that nuisance mines are really the only mines that can work without support. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and get into what the types of support you can give to your minefield to really give them an edge and help them make the most of what the mines are capable of doing. So we have three primary categories, team support, self support, duration support. And team support is things like your friends, your teammates, uh, overwatch or fire support uh, on the field. Self support is things you can do yourself with relative ease. Uh, this could be things like jamming uh, ships, ambush ships near the minefield, or um, adding missile fire to supplement your mines. And duration support is things that don't necessarily happen specifically because you're trying to help the minefield, but are rather things that happen as a consequence of the game happening around the minefields that can benefit them. And we'll get into the details of all of these now. So within team support, specifically what you're looking for is things like putting fire onto enemies. Now this has several benefits that can really emphasize the lethality of your mines. Putting fire onto an enemy approaching a minefield tends to put a pressure on them that can influence the decision and risk assessment uh, of approaching that minefield. It can also make clearing the minefield nearly impossible. So let's go back to our theoretical scenario of a voxel group approaching a minefield and it wants to get through it. So it wants to, but while it's trying to go through this minefield, you have a container liner who pops up, or pardon me, not a container liner, a uh, bulk liner, uh, a bulk freighter, who pops up on the other side of the minefield, some distance away, not within the danger zone of the mines, but he's now putting 250 fire onto the vox holes. Let's say the mines are placed around a rock, and now what that vox hole wants to do is get to that rock to get out of the line of fire. And in the way of this, your minefield stands. So now this voxel is forced with a dilemma of risking your minefield and praying that their point defense is good enough to clear whatever's left of that field, it could be a fully intact field even, or completely disengaging, leaving that area entirely, and in doing so, it can upgrade your minefield even if it wasn't in a block or a pivot role, it is now a block or pivot role, uh, pivot um, field with the assistance of that teammate. Another really critical thing with this is it prevents them from sitting outside, just floating outside your minefield and clearing. Very often with other fields, you're going to have ships sitting completely stationary and just putting RPF fire onto the mines. And if you're instead shooting at them, they're not going to be clearing those mines. There are very, very few people who are going to ignore a ship shooting at them in favor of clearing a mine. The exception to that is when they really, really need to get that capture point, which we'll get into with the duration section. But in that situation, there's now a huge win for you because you're getting free damage onto that Vox hole. Well, it has to clear the mines anyways. Self-support is one that I recommend people really build into mine fleets. Um, if your fleet is nothing but two cargo feeders and a ton of sprint mines, that's cool. That's probably effective, but it's not as good as it could have been if you were to instead add some support on top of it. One of the really big things is mines with their nearly microscopic radar cross section are incredibly easy to hide with very minimal jammer support. A single jammer shuttle or really just a J-15 Bellbird anywhere can hide an entire minefield from an approaching ship. And while most ships are gonna be using things like burn through to spot mines anyways, and this won't really change that, what it does do is prevent things like automated point defense from really being able to do its job. For instance, if you're using burn tracks only, the bullseye won't auto lock and 250 RPF won't auto task. Weapons like the Sarissa or even slightly longer range weapons like Aurora, who has a little bit of an edge over things like the Defender, won't engage the mines because they can't get an internal fire control lock on the mines. Another thing this can do is, with that fire control lock is it can really degrade things like the Defender fire control. Something you'll notice if you start supplementing your minefield with jamming support is suddenly defenders stop working, really. Um, and this is because the mines, first of all, are going to show up really late on the radar, which gives the defender a much smaller window to react. And further, because their fire control lock is degraded, they're going to be much more inaccurate and take longer to kill each individual mine. This, combined with something like bouncing behavior, which is exacerbated by jamming, can make defenders completely inadequate against nearly any amount of mines. I've had groups of six or more defenders, an entire Solomon and its PD escorts, be able to stop two mines that activated because I had been covering it under Bellbird jamming. Another way you can self-support is by using ambush ships near your minefields. When people approach a minefield, very often they're going to stop in place, and because they're more often than not staying away from wherever your minefield is, 
You can use that to your advantage by setting a ship up at a different angle where they're less likely to expect you coming in from because they're focused on the mines. Doing things like hiding rocket shuttles under a rock and having it pop out and do a rocket run on our theoretical Vauxhall group who are clearing the mines um, or hitting corvettes or really just anybody who's stationary and clearing can be really effective because what people tend to do is they'll leave the mine clearing tedium because it is rather tedious um, to the automated systems and they'll focus on fleet elements elsewhere on battles happening elsewhere or just generally anything but watching RPF blow up mines for 20 minutes. Uh, and when they hear a new radar contact, at a certain point, they're going to get alarm fatigue where they think, okay, my ship just sees another mine. And they find out that's incorrect when their Vauxhall suddenly takes 18 rockets to the side. Another element of using an ambush ship or another ship near a minefield um, is you can use things like missiles to create extra point defense targets. Say a Solomon looks like he's going to run right into your minefield. He thinks his big, mean point defense is going to be able to punch right through one end out the other and take the point. One thing you can very quickly ruin his day is by firing size 2s at him right around the time he starts activating the minefield. What this will do very quickly, especially with something like an MLS-2, which fires 4 missiles per launcher, is you can very, very quickly overwhelm the point defense with these size 2s. And then when combined with things like the sprit mines, who are going 700 meters a second, things can very quickly go from a situation where the Solomon is totally fine pushing in to suddenly he's been hit by 7 mines, he's out of command, and now more mines are activating, and with the point defense uh, either destroyed or degraded, maybe the radar has been taken out, they're totally helpless to these mines coming in. And now you might have situations as well where the point defense leaks one of the missiles. So let's say you've done this now, and none of your mines hit, but the size 2s hit. That's still a win for you because those size 2 hits can do things like take out radar panels, point defense, the radar, as I said earlier, and it's going to make that ship much worse against the remainder of your minefield or any future minefields or even just your teammates' missile attacks. Finally, there's the most indirect of support, which is duration support. Now, duration support kind of exemplifies the concept that for every minute that passes in your game, the mines get stronger. If your minefield is getting hit at, say, five minutes into a match, it's not going to do as well as a minefield of an identical type is going to be getting hit at 25 minutes into the match, um, even if otherwise the situation be identical. Now, some of the heavy influence on this is the time pressure of the capture points. So, for instance, if ANS is really down on points, they really need the cap, and you put mines on the cap. What's going to happen is instead of having the luxury of sitting out of the cap zone and putting RPF fire on the things, they need that cap, they need it now, and so what you're going to do, and you're going to see, is there's a sharp increase in the amount of things like suicide corvettes or just suiciding ships in general. I've seen suicide voxels because they are just that desperate, and generally your minefields are going to suddenly be devastating. They're going to go from a nuisance to the worst thing that ANS player has seen all day. Another factor into this is when someone's rushing onto a point, they're not going one-third speed, they're going full speed, and even sometimes going flank speed. And what that's doing for you is it's artificially increasing the velocity of your mines by, you know, something small, but 40 meters a second, 30 meters a second. It's not insignificant, and especially as it takes a couple of seconds to, to do so, um, you can easily have an enemy ship move 200, 300 meters for your mine and increase your point defense penetration by that virtue alone. Another thing that happens in these kind of late game cap scrambles is ships with no point defense or ships that don't have a radar or have never had a radar to begin with, um, they move for these caps because their team needs them and they'll walk straight into mines with, with no answer to them. I've had players who are running uh, a seven keystone blind array gets to late game and suddenly they keep just walking keystones right in the minefields because none of the keystones can see the mines coming. The, the earliest warning that player will get is when one pops into visual range and by then the ship's dead. Like, there's no hope for them. Obviously, you're not always going to have ships walk in on a silver platter. It's not always going to happen. But things like scout rains that don't have point defense, things like e-war ships, etc., etc., do definitely exist in games and they definitely will go for caps in the late game. And those are the kind of ships that get completely decimated by minefields um, on the cap, near the cap, just anywhere on the map. And along this line, um, ships that have had their point defense degraded can also get really messed up by these minefields. 
Um, another thing you do see, and this one causes people a bit of rage, is when they lose one quadrant of their radar and they don't notice, and that quadrant happens to be where some mines come from. They might be walking into one of your minefields, they're clearing everything just fine in three-fourths of their ship, and then they don't notice that their top right panel is destroyed until three sprint mines slam into them from that angle. And that's really something that um, people rushing onto these points can get affected by. If they had sat outside and cleared, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, so now that I've, I've thoroughly info dumped you, we're going to have a cahoot here now. Um, now, I should say this cahoot is for fun. If you don't want to participate, you don't have to participate. I recommend you do because it's a fun little activity and it'll kind of assess how much um, you've been paying attention. The winner of this cahoot will be named the Mine Apprentice. Given that I am a mine wizard, I do need an apprentice to uh, take over my mine tower in the mine anomicon when I decide to go into wizard retirement. So it'd be nice to know what my successor is going to be. Um, after this quick cahoot, we will move on to questions and also if you want to debate me on things. So one moment, we will start this cahoot. Once again, this is totally optional, but feel free. I will give it uh, two minutes or so for people to get in here if they want to join. And uh, if nobody joins, I'll just be sad. Wait. Sorry, as somebody that has uh, just joined from here, uh, Kahoot, what's this for? Uh, we just have, we are at the end of a, a mine lecture and we're having a bit of a Kahoot at the end. Yes, we are, we, are, we are doing a Kahoot to test our mine wizardry knowledge. Do you not know? I, 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 on not mine know laying mine or uh, just for fun? Both. Yes, yes. Nice. I will definitely take a look at this. Uh, sir, mine wizard. May I inquire as to the source of your mine uh, wizardry certificate of uh, PhD that you got? Where, where, where did you get that from? Uh, I got go it. I got it from the war, of course. No, uh, so um, <laughs> it is. It is an honorary PhD bestowed upon me by my traumatized victims. I see. I see. Yep. Okay, we're gonna be I beginning have... in one minute here. So last call for. Uh, aspirants to the mind wizard title is the college of your traumatized victims accredited anywhere uh yeah it's the the tester institute <laughs> i was about to say ask anyone with a green name and they will attest to tuna's mind skills <laughs> okay we're ability go to get to get minds nerfed not once but three times <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and begin here but was it reasonable for mines to be nerfed three times? I will read the questions out loud in case there is some lag. What is the fuel range of an M50 Sprint Mine? One person got that correct. Congratulations. What? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, uh, M50 sprint mines have an extra 100 meters of fuel over every other type of mine. The, the fuck they do? Bruh. <laughs> Bruh. Why are they sprint mines then? Shouldn't they be marathon Which mines? mine is least effective in a nuisance roll? You can see I hit you with the hard question first. All these other ones are going to be easy. <laughs> So M30s are not great in a nuisance roll because with the nuisance roll you want maximum lethality. I thought the M30Ns were going to be the least effective nuisance ones because of the rock problem. That is true, but we're assuming that the mines are going to hit for, for such a thing. Um, Wait, we're assuming? You know what happens when you do oh, that. Oh, we, we shouldn't assume you're right. Which of the following is a HVML, high volume mine layer? Somebody hit me. I was, I'm glad no one clicked the cello, at if, least. If you really, really try, the cello could be a high-volume mine layer. <laughs> it doesn't have enough <laughs> slots. Really, I guess you could. 
Yeah, but it's yeah, not one. I cannot believe this. Fix fields have what properties? Let's go. So fixed fields um, do not traditionally split blobs as they don't really have the volume for it. And they also won't really prevent movement in area, but their main goal is that they are gonna um, slow people down and uh, get shot at. True or false, dead ships can trigger mines. I know we have our one asterisk, but we're going to ignore that one asterisk. Oh. Uh, uh, so co-ops can uh, pull their friends on the dead ships, but all mines will not activate themselves on dead ships. Oh, we've had a, a lead change here. All these assumptions. Of what Eek. is mine bouncing? Ikahu commentary. Nice. Well done, everybody. What type of support is missiles? Uh, now, while your team can technically use missiles, the reason why missiles don't fall under team support is you very often need the missile ship near the minefield to be able to get the missiles onto the ship in time for it to be relevant with the field. Uh, teammates are going to be very hard to get them to get missiles in at just the right moment, uh, especially if they have to travel some distance. See, much like real cahoots, all the questions are bullshit. <laughs> this is the uh, last uh, question for points, by the way. Why do N30Ns cost more per kill? Oh, hey, it's that asterisk we were talking about. Well done, everyone. And one final question for all those in the Kahoot as Wolf takes the lead. Do you feel like you learned something today? Okay, all of those who answered green have been uh, expelled from the Mine Apprentice title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So, thank you all for participating in the quiz. We have Ra with a very happy smiley face in third. Murphy in second. And the new Mine Apprentice, Wolf. Congratulations. Well, this is, well, this is awkward. I haven't Wolf. actually used mines in like at least a couple months. You're obligated to now. I have literally never used a mine in my entire time playing this So, with game that game. fun bit over, we're now with the questions and answer, and also the argue with me section, because I know you want to do it. Now is your time. Uh, we'll take questions and comments and whatnot from the audience. I wasn't here, but that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Sentence to 50 co-op mines uh, with no antenna. Oh, time to couch up. <laughs> Did you did you load enough parries? AMMs. What are those? <laughs> I should check the chat to see if there's questions in chat. There is not. Okay. What is uh, your opinion on a container liner filled with nothing but mine containers? Ooh. So funny enough, Does I've that actually gained enough volume to like make it not a new just a nuisance, but an actual thing. So funny enough, I've actually had to fight that before. I've, I've actually encountered a mine-only container liner before. My opinion on it is that while you can get substantial volume out, I think you actually can get maybe more mines than a normal ship. The lack of enforcement 
means that no matter what you do, your fields are going to be um, really unreliable. If we go back quite a few slides and we go to here, um, just look at, at how many mines you're needing to hit, for instance, like a fix effect with the, the M30s. You know, you're in your 40s uh, mines, you you're almost need 60 mines to break out of it. And you can do that. You can force it out of the nuisance roll. Um, but in doing so, you're spending a lot of points for a field that isn't quite as effective. And without the enforcement mines of the N or the um, 50, things like uh, ships walking in or um, even just, uh, you know, so that field will be hard to clear, but ships are able to just walk right in. Um, if they have a lot of point defense, um, they're risking it. They can get hit, but generally it's not going to be as effective as, as another type of field. And that's why I think container liners are their own thing, primarily nuisance. But yes, you can use them in other roles as well. Any other uh, questions? What would be your opinion on variants of mine containers? Yeah, I was I was just gonna say, uh, one. What about the consideration for uh, the fact that uh, containers just have enough HP to uh, get through, even with the lack of enforcement sometimes? Oh, but, but no, the containers drop mines which are identical to normally laid mines. Like we're not talking about we're not talking about like container missiles. We're talking about mine containers which drop mines. Oh yeah. Yeah, so I think I heard a bit of an interesting question on there, which was container variants, I believe. So was that like saying like containers that would drop a co-op or a sprint mine? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, okay. So my thoughts on those is the only reason why the container liner is not the optimal mine layer is it can't do those things. Because right <laughs> now, I think that the container liner actually places more mines per point than a, like a bulk freighter or um, a cargo feeder which is a bit of a scary thought and the only reason it's not optimal is because it can't place those specialist mines now imagine if at the beginning of the game i can throw five to ten sprint mines under every goddamn rock on the map that is hell that'd be very strong i'm not opposed to the idea but you would need to buff the manually placed mines such as decreasing their cost really making the container variants expensive um, or just something to make it not just better. Yeah, they they would be price adjusted to match their power, but it would give you the option should you want to. Yeah, I think that's not like that's not something I'm going to say like no horrible never speak again, but it's something I'd be concerned about at least um, because it is a lot of power to the container liner. Any other questions? All right, my se my my second and final question of the Q and A section: How much wood would a woodchuck chuck woodchuck could chuck wood? Uh, one co-op and a reactor bloom. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Well, any last questions? If not, we'll call it here. There is one in the chat. Oh, there's oh, one yeah, in the there chat. Uh, do you think it's worth it? So, okay, my thoughts of the mine, putting mine containers on that slot is, yes, it gives you range. It gives you flexibility. But the disadvantage being you're trading an entire hard point to four mines, if I'm not mistaken. Um, which isn't going to do anything not even really in a in a mind bombing role four mines usually might not be enough to kill someone so i think that using container mines on a feeder generally isn't worth you doing uh because you could get more in that same situation from just using a container missile um or using something like uh even a rocket container if you wanted to um, if you're going to use a feeder for a mine laying roll, you should really be using the ML9. I, otherwise, you just you don't get enough volume to do anything. 
Uh, Hang-ups don't prevent co-op minds from communicating, but they can cause erroneous activation um, by making friendly ships fail the IFF check. I've got a quick question. I missed the first half of the lecture, so I don't know if this was covered, but do co-op mines activate other non-co-op mines that they pass by when they go off? Um, no, so they will only um, interact with other co-op mines because co-op mines have the network capability uh, stat. If they don't have the network capability stat, they won't be talking to each other. So even if a, you have a co-op mine in a field of sprint mines or a field of normal mines, um, the cooperative won't activate anybody else. Anyone else? Question? Concern? Argument? Calling my minds bad? Any of that? Uh, so the main solution to a friendly mind chasing you is don't get chased. I know that's lame. I know that's not helpful. But there is nothing you can do about that except for being preventative. Um, so as a player dealing with minefields, keep an eye on your on the minefields. Don't go within two kilometers unless you need to. Um, you know, call out the mine layer if he's putting mines in a bad spot. Uh, he is a teammate. You can talk to them. And if you're a mine layer yourself, you need to be proactive in reminding your teammates, hey, there's a minefield here. I know you're getting shot at. Keep that in mind. Because that's a really good reminder for people to check, hey, is my antenna up? Is my comms on? It, you know, do I need to go where those mines are? And you can really avoid a lot of incidents by just be being active and communicating. You're engine up missiles with laying mines. So yeah, that sounds like your comms might have been off or your antenna got sniped, and that, that is an inherent risk with placing mines. Um, this is mentioned in the guide, it's not mentioned here, but if you're a mine layer and you are placing mines and it looks like your antenna is about to get sniped, you can abandon ship if you think saving the field is more important. Um, because if you're going to lose your antenna anyways, you're going to lose the ship. Uh, what it'll do is it'll at least save the mines. So you may need to make a judgment call like that sometimes, depending on the situation. Mine, maps that I don't think are worth. Okay, that is a good question. And there's a big asterisk and it says, it depends. Um, so there are maps I think mines are really good on. Uh, those are Caltrop, Tumbleweed, and somewhat Pillars. There's some spots on Pillars where mines are really good. Nix's Eye and canyon aren't really good for mines and the big feature with those is the maps are big and the reason that's bad for mines is it means there is um, first of all there's a, the cover is a lot less restrictive people aren't as stuck near the rocks there's a lot more void for them to play around in, and when they're playing in the void they're less likely to get hit by your mines and they're more likely to be able to clear your mines from a safe distance another reason is it's harder to lay your mines Unless you're running a container liner on a map like Canyon, you're only really going to be able to mine a handful of spots. Whereas on a map like Caltrop or on a map like Pillars, you can really mine your entire half of the map with relative impunity uh, using even just a single ship. Um, there are some modded maps that are fantastic for mines. The Rift comes to mind. Um, anyone who's played the Rift, you know those honeycomb structures. You put some mines in there, it's basically guaranteed death for somebody. Um, and it just keeps them away from the honeycomb entirely, and it's nearly impossible to clear because the honeycomb will protect you from RPF. Areas like that, fantastic. If the Generally, rule of thumb, if the map is big and open, it's bad for mines. Anything else? Any, any other questions? Any comments? Concerns? Well, I see somebody's typing. I don't know if that's a question. If it is, I'll answer it. But otherwise, we'll end it here. Um, 
All right, in that case, we will end the lecture here. Um, thank you all for attending uh, this class. Um, Already gone. I, I believe my Discord just crashed, which is, I believe, God's way of saying that is, in fact, time to end the lecture. Um, <laughs> thank you for the lecture. Was good. So, yeah, thank you all for attending. I hope you all learned something valuable, and you're going to be able to take this knowledge into your games and kind of know what your minefields are doing, how to better use your minefields, and maybe um, kind of see mines in a new light. Uh, if not, I hope it was at least entertaining, and I hope that uh, everybody enjoyed. So thank you all.